Charles Dickens, the celebrated English novelist, writing a novel on the French Revolution of the 18th century, made a comment. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. This comment is very apt so far as 18th century India is concerned. Here we would see certain features of the 18th century, particularly the socio-economic ones, because the political history is more or less fairly well known. In looking at the 18th century, the Indian and European historians since 19th century had given it different terminology, had used different categories, and even in modern times, in the second half of the 20th century, the debate has not died down. The principal focus, which comes uh, so far in the writings of these Indian and uh, European historians, is one, the decline of the Mughal Empire and the rise of the successor states. But while looking at these principal focus, certain other uh, elements and issues come in. For example, we have the aspirations of the Marathas to form an empire and challenge both the Mughal and the British. Then we have the rise of the British East India Company and its domination, particularly after 1765. Here, we would see these three principal features, and also we would see certain issues which are involved in this. While dealing with the decline of the Mughal Empire, the late 19th and the early 20th century writers, like William Arvin, Jodhanath Sarkar, had dwelt on the weakness of the Mughal Empire, weakness of the Mughal emperors also, and also the internal faction fighting of the Mughals. We would not go into that. Professor Satish Chandra had written an excellent monograph on this issue, and this is quite available nowadays. We'll see only the rise of the successor states so far as this particular feature is concerned. Before we go to the successor states, we see certain issues involved in it. One was that there had been attempts to see that apart from the faction fighting, apart from the personal weaknesses of the Mughal emperors, there were other issues involved, other effects involved also in the decline of the Mughal Empire. For example, Oshin Dasgupta has seen the downfall of Surat, which is a link, according to him, with the decline of the Mughal Empire. This view has been recently criticized, and uh, more or less it continues to hold its ground, but there are criticisms on this issue to a certain extent. At least after 1750, this becomes a different issue altogether. Then the other issue that comes up is the de-urbanization. That is, the urban areas of Mughal India were falling into pieces. Count of Modav, the Frenchman, came to India, particularly to North India, around 1774, and he has described in detail the devastated ruins of Agra and Delhi. The Indians also are witnesses to this kind of devastation. Mir Takimir, who was in Delhi as a court poet, had gone to Faizabad, to Nawababawad, in the late 18th century, and when he was asked from where he was coming, 
हिसेद दहली जो एक शहर था आलम में इंतिखाब दहली वाज वन से सिटी इट वाज द पीपल ऑफ द आई एंड ही वाज लिविंग देयर एंड इट हैज बीन टोटली रेन्ड एंड डिवास्टेटेड सो देयरफॉर दिस डिवास्टेशन थ्योरी द डी अर्बनाइजेशन थ्योरी वाज होल्डिंग गुड फॉर सम टाइम बट देन certain new elements are coming new researches are coming which show that there are problems in totally accepting this thesis for example c a bailey in an a uh, book on the bazaars of north india markets and bazaars and towns has found out that new areas are coming up new urban areas are coming up and that new people new business contacts are going on muzaffar alam about whom we see a little bit later also he had shown that south and bengal were becoming prosperous in the second half of the uh, 18th century starting from the first half itself but the fact remains that since then other american writers are insisting on certain other issues like the social cohesion of the community and so on and so forth not all of these could be entertained or even accepted but the fact remains that these are coming out in quite large numbers <laughs> we would now go straight to the successor states of the 18th century which was the principal feature of the period generally we can divide the successor states into two types the first one is that those states founded by those people who were either moghul nobles or who had excellent contacts with the moghuls bengal avad hyderabad uh, jaipur fall in this kind of cate- category the second one is a kind of state who which were anti moghul maharashtra jats rahilas and so on so forth so therefore one would have to see a little bit of these some elements of these successor states to see that although we had put them in a certain category there are differences within and there are vast differences between one region of the country and the other beyond this lies the aspiration of the marathas to form an empire which we would see also and also the rise of the english east india company as a dominating power first in bengal and then in the north india with devastating effects but first we come to the successor states whose founders were connected with the mogol system James Grant stated and we know also from other sources that there was a tremendous import of bullion that is the money flying from Europe as well as from western asia as a result the prices in bengal were rising particularly of the coarse cloth but the revenue was fixed almost fixed between 1658 during the time of shuja to 1721 to murshid kuli khan the revenue has not increased much it remained at 1 crore 10 lakh of rupees but there were certain extra taxes which were taken part of which were appropriated by the zamindars who are also very happy but this shows that there was no connection between the revenue and the prices the revenue was slowly increasing 
prices were slowly increasing also, but then the revenue stopped till 1765, after which it uh, uh, rose tremendously. But the prices began to increase very, very slowly. One of the reasons it has been stated, and perhaps it can be criticized also, that in Bengal, the Murshid Kuli Khan and his successors, they depended to a very great extent on uh, merchants like uh, Jagat Shet, who was ex exactly a Mahajan and not a merchant. It is through Jagat Shet that the revenue was being sent to Delhi and he gradually became a very important figure dominating the mint of Murshidabad at the same time. It has been stated that the reason why Jagat Shet was becoming important was that the Nawabs did not want to collect revenue through their normal channels, but they wanted to utilize the people like Jagat Shet, the Mahajans and the bankers, etc. This is, of course, found to be totally uh, incorrect in the sense that at least till the time of Murshid Kuli Khan, there were a large number of Kanungos who used to collect revenue or, or at least were responsible for the collection of revenue. So therefore in Bengal we see that there was a different kind of nexus, a connection between the Nawab and the bankers. The connection that we see in case of the anti-Mughal group Maharashtra, much later, which we would see in due course. Bengal was at the same time moving towards a new kind of urbanization. It was the rise of Murshidabad. And Murshidabad was not a simple city. It has its connection with the raw material market, Kasim Bazar, the famous silk market. Now, Murshidabad, according to Lord Clive, who came there in 1764, stated that Murshidabad population was greater than that of London. He was, of course, totally amazed when he went to see the treasury, the huge treasury of the Murshidabad Nawab, all of which vanished within another 50 years. This kind of a nexus, this kind of urbanization, and this kind of the huge accumulation of wealth could partly be seen in case of Awadh. In Awadh, in 1720, Sadat Ali Khan became the Jagirdar of Awadh, started a new dynasty himself, established almost once again a semi-independent state, maintaining its contact with the Mughal system. But like Bengal, Awadh also did not want any kind of transfer of Jagis. Actually, after a time, the centralized Mughal system was not necessary for either Bengal or Awadh. They, had, they are becoming imp important and independent. Bengal had to pay for this. Awadh also had to pay in a certain way. Now, Awadh's uh, agriculture had expanded, as ha has been told to us by Muzaffar Alam, this recent scholar. He said, and he compared it the Aini Akbari, 1595 96 production figures with the late 18th century production figures of Awadh. And he said that there had been a tremendous agricultural expansion. But he does not tell us of the price. He has very little uh, documents on the revenue. So therefore, it is difficult to say whether the peasants were overburdened or not, or whether the peasants were benefiting from the expansion of agriculture. In any case, 
Awadh continued till 1764 when they fought along with the Nawab Mir Qasim of Bengal against the English at Boxar. Tot they were totally defeated. And then since then, Awadh turned towards a dependency of the English. And later on, uh, the English practically dominated the whole of Awadh taking the Awadh under its total control and direct management in 1856. But the history of Awadh is a history that showed how the Nawabs could hoodwink the English from time to time, could try to maintain its independence, try to maintain its own police and the army, and how it had failed. Apart from uh, Awadh, there was the other state, which is the state of Jaipur. Jaipur was one of the Mughal vassals, Mughal Mansabdas, one might say. Man Singh became the first Mansabdar under Akbar. And since then, his dynasty continued to be the Mansabdas of the Mughal Empire. But gradually, from the second half of the 18th century, Jaipur dynasty began to stop payment of revenue or peshkars to the Mughal government. By that time, the situation of the Mughal emperor has become very, very difficult. It, it has been stated that the Mughal empire extended from Delhi to Palam. And that was the kingdom of Shah Alam. But that, whatever that may be, the things remained that Jaipur Raja was a Jamidar. He remained a Jamidar and became a Raja, calling them a Raja, tried to become independent of the Mughal system. But still, under pressure, they would pay some money, they would pay some revenue, and continue to play hide and seek with the Mughal Empire throughout the 18th century. So the 18th century is a period in which the Mughal state officials founded their dynasties, founded semi-independent states, but continued to maintain some contact with the Mughals, sometimes looking for approval. Then we come to those states which were anti-Mughal. In this anti-Mughal state, the most important and the most powerful was Maharashtra. Maharashtra's origin, or it's the origin of the leaders, could be seen in their jamidaris. They were the jamidars of the area, and therefore their outlook to a certain extent had remained confined to the outlook of a Jamidar. But at the same time, they were trying to formulate an empire covering entire North India and the Deccan. As a result, they had conflicts with the Mughals. They had later conflicts with the English, which proved fatal to them. And they had continuous conflict with the Nizam of Hyderabad. Nizam of Hyderabad actually belonged to the first group. But the documents are very mega. So therefore, it is very difficult to say anything on the Nizam, and that's why it has been more or less omitted. But it remained a sort of a semi-independent state throughout sometimes against the Marathas, later against the Tipu Sultan of Mysore, but always for the English. Now, in case of Maharashtra, the principal revenue comes from their internal taxation. But in this internal taxation, there are different complications. 
there were peasants who had hereditary lands that there are peasants who do not have hereditary lands but had to pay taxes one of the attempts of the peshwas to see that these peasants who do not have hereditary lands should pay little or rather to help these peasants this did not always come out in reality but the fact remains that the marathas they have their own uh, system of jagis hereditary jagis called saranyam they had the right they claim of living two taxes chaut and sardeshmukhi which they levied from the late 17th century of shibaji's period they had also what is known as mulkgiri the expansion outside and the plunder outside so as a state it had certain contradictory functions on the one hand trying to help the peasants who do not have lands on the other hand they were trying to extend an empire and plundering the areas and then again they do not want the transfer of jagis should this should remain so therefore there are different kinds of policies inherent in the system of maharashtra's administration now in this system the principal one which came out from 1750 onwards was the formation or rather the control of northern india and it was the third battle of panipat that was devastating for the marathas but they came up again and uh, mahada mahadaji sindhya who was given the appointment of the commander in chief of the mogol empire by the mogol emperor shah alam and then one year later the prestigious post vakil mubalik for the entire mogol empire that is the regent of the moguls but mahadaji sindhya had two contradictory features once again one is that he had a vision of the empire but this vision was limited only to certain portions of northern india and secondly he had a vision to take the european infantry in his army he did not train he did not arrange to train his army into the european lines but he took the army of the born a frenchman and with the help of this army he could defeat some of the other indian powers but this was a limited vision the limited vision in the sense that once dibon is gone the english got the opportunity and secondly the limit of the vision of the empire created financial problems for mahadaj sindhya so the in uh, the maharashtrian empire therefore there were two contradictory tendencies so far as finance is concerned one is outside maharashtra particularly in northern india there was always a financial crisis one would have to maintain an army one would have to pay the army but one would have to collect the revenue and that is not enough the inside the maharashtra empire rather near pune there was some kind of financial uh, influence affluence in which the bankers and the mahajans and the sarafs they got very prominent position one reason was that they could always lend money which the peshwa could never pay or other leaders could never pay but this kind of contradictory financial situations plagued the Mar- maratha empire right from the beginning so therefore when the english came particularly after the death of tipu sultan of mysore in 1799 
the Marathas who had supported the English in killing Tipu Sultan along with the Nizam, they now found themselves confronting the English. And the English defeated them in 1804 and 1818, and the Peshwa Bajirao finally have, had to go and stay at Bithur under the pension of the English government. So therefore the anti mughal tendency of the Maratha Empire, that did not last long because the Mughal Empire did not last long in that sense, but they lost much earlier. So therefore, as we would see in the next uh, day, there were other group, other members of this group, other states of this group, who were anti-Mughal in their stance, but who could not really establish their own state in the same kind or in the same form, although some of them tried to imitate the Mughal Empire. Thank you.